Hey everyone, today's video is on abdominal access techniques, specifically the Barrett's Needle technique. We've got some other videos on general techniques as well as one on the OptiView or direct optical trocar that you can check out, but this one's just going to focus specifically on the Barrett's Needle. It's a new academic year and it just seems like a good time to review some of these very basic techniques that we use very frequently. But first, why even talk about abdominal access? And abdominal access uh, for minimally invasive surgery is actually a very important part of the operation. In a lot of ways, it can be the most dangerous part of an operation. And that's because one, it's done blindly, right? By definition, before we're in the abdominal cavity, we're not able to see what we're doing. Um, and it's also uh, done into a cavity that's really filled with nothing but potential space, right? Once we get into the abdominal cavity and insufflate with our CO2, we're able to look around and see, and it seems like there's a lot of room, but you got to remember that before we are insufflating, everything is crammed up right next to each other, that there is no real space. And so anytime you're getting into to the abdominal cavity, there's a reasonable risk that you could damage one of these underlying organs. And so we have specific techniques and tactics to uh, prevent this from happening. So the varus needle is probably one of, if not the most popular technique for accessing the abdomen, and it's sometimes called the closed technique. Um, and that's for several reasons. First, it's a very quick technique. Um, it's gotten better um, for use in obese patients. And what I mean by that is that obese patients can make other techniques much more difficult, whereas a varus needle still is, is roughly about the same. Um, it usually leads to smaller fascial defects than something like a Hassan mini laparotomy. Uh, and then it's a simpler closure at the end as well. Instead of digging down through all this fat to try to basically suture the fascia, you're usually able to use a relatively simple device to do a quick fascial closure. Now that said, there are some risks which are higher with the use of a varus or closed technique as opposed to a Hassan or open technique. And the primary major risk that could really impact a patient's overall um, life trajectory would be a major vascular injury. Um, this could lead to either bleeding or even more catastrophically in air embolism. We'll talk about these later, but the risk is very, very low. So all these advantages combined with very low risks is what has made this such a popular technique. So to understand how this works, first we need to look at the anatomy of the varus needle itself. And so I blew this up, but you can't really see it too well. So I'm gonna draw it as well. Basically starting about here, there's a hollow needle and then inside there's a blunt obturator at the end. So if you can imagine a hollow needle, something like this, and then coming out of that, a blunt obturator. So when you stab this needle through tissue, any firmly resisting tissue is going to push on that operator that is spring-loaded and is going to retract into that hollow needle and retract up to the point where it runs into that sharp needle, which then is able to cut through this tissue. And then this operator is going to snap back out into its previous position to help protect any important structures or organs on the other side of this needle. So using a needle like that is one way in which we can hope to try to protect the organs of the abdominal cavity. Uh, and the other way is to use important um, safe sites of access or sites that have been determined to be safe based on most people's anatomy. So the two most common sites and the ones that I'm gonna talk about today are the umbilicus, roughly right around here in the middle of the abdomen, and then Palmer's point which is usually defined as two finger breaths inferior to the left costal margin in the left midclavicular line. And so why are these sites so useful? So first, the umbilicus uh, can be very useful because there's the umbilical stalk, which can be easily picked up by something like a penetrating towel clamp and then pulled up towards the ceiling, which then pulls the abdominal wall away from any underlying organs, lets those fall down by gravity, and theoretically gives you some space to safely enter with a needle. Um, the risk of the umbilical access technique is you can imagine that the biggest blood vessels in the body run in the midline, the aorta and the IVC. So there is a risk of injury when you access with a various technique in the midline. Um, and really that can be actually much closer than you think sometimes as little as two to four centimeters between the aorta and the anterior fascia. And that's why a technique like Palmer's point can be quite, um, popular. So up here, theoretically in the left upper quadrant, somewhere over here, um, is a relatively safe space. You'd have to go very deep to hit any sort of major vascular structure. And it'd have to be something like a splenic artery going out this way to the spleen. But realistically, there's stomach, there's omentum. Um, it's usually a fairly safe space. Even if you got into one of those structures, it would be a fairly easy fix and unlikely to seriously injure the patient. And that is an argument for Palmer's point. 
The other aspect is that when you think about the costal margin here, that the abdominal wall is fixed up to this costal margin. So when you push down, that gives you some counter tension against your needle. Um, that again, kind of functions similar to holding up the umbilicus, allowing us to push a needle down without the expectation that the organs are going to be right up there next to the abdominal wall. Now, thinking about where we're accessing, it's important to know what structures of the abdominal cavity we're going through because that impacts how we decide if we're in the abdominal cavity or not. So you can imagine if we're accessing at the umbilicus, we're coming here in the midline into the abdominal cavity through the linea alba. And one aspect of the varus needle, like we talked about, it's got that blunt obturator that clicks back uh, when it goes through tough tissue. And so usually we've made an incision at the skin, so there's nothing... Um, no clicks happening at the skin. So you'll usually hear clicks when you pass through fascial layers and the peritoneum. So at the midline, you're gonna hear a click, one click when you hit the linea alba or that fascial layer, and then a second click when you go through the peritoneum into the abdominal cavity. So that's usually two clicks in the midline. That's, a, for example, the umbilicus. Palmer's point is over lateral, and that's going through the rectus um, most of the time. And so when you're going through the rectus, you're listening for a different number of clicks, specifically three clicks, because you're going to go through your anterior rectus sheath, your posterior rectus sheath, and then your peritoneum posteriorly. Of course, um, since we're above the arcuate line for almost all of our varus needle entries, um, we're usually either going to have two clicks on the alba or three clicks if we're lateral going through rectus sheath. So now getting through the specific techniques of using the needle. So I'll draw this out a little bit. So let's imagine we've got our abdominal wall here. We'll say we've got rectus here, kind of splitting out into our three lateral muscles that way. And um, let's say we're going in through Palmer's point, for example. Often we'll make an incision through the skin. Then we'll place the needle through that incision and start pushing down. Um, we, since we're in Palmer's point, we don't need to pull up on the abdominal wall here. It's important that you hold the needle delicately. You're not grabbing this, you know, like a, a big knife that you're stabbing downwards. You want to be holding it rather gently, kind of like a pencil or a dollar. So you really get good haptic feedback and you're slowly passing it down through these layers of the abdominal wall. And you're listening for your clicks. And usually you're going to hear one click, a second click, and then a third click as you pass through that peritoneum and get into the abdominal cavity. Once you hear that third click, you're going to do a gentle wiggle. And you can imagine that if your needle's all the way through, there's nothing holding the tip in place. So the needle's going to wiggle along this axis this way in all these directions. Whereas if your needle tip is stuck in some layer and you go to wiggle it around, you can imagine that that tip's going to stay relatively fixed in place. It's not going to easily move around that axis. That axis, I should say. Um, if you've hit, heard your three clicks, you feel like it's kind of wiggling appropriately, then you do what's called the aspiration and drop test. And that's when you attach a syringe to the end of your, great, the drawn syringe right there, a syringe to the end of your varus needle, and you're going to first aspirate. And so you draw back and you're, that's a way of checking to see if you're in an organ, um, for example, the bowel or the stomach, or if you're in a major vascular structure. And so if you aspirate and you get blood or you get bile, then you're very concerned about injury. However, usually you draw back and you don't get anything to come up. You just get some bubbles through the saline and then you're pretty happy with that. Then you inject and you inject saline and you want that to flow freely into the abdominal cavity. Then you take your needle, your syringe off your needle and you look for this little meniscus of fluid that's left within that top of the needle. And you check to see if that falls nicely down into the abdominal cavity when you gently lift up on the needle. That's called the drop test. If this drop flows freely, again, there should be really an open potential space at the end there with some negative pressure. So that drop should flow down freely. And then the final check is you hook your needle up to the CO2 insufflation and you check your initial insufflation pressures. And so remember that Typically, we're insufflating the abdomen to a pressure of about 15 millimeters of mercury. And when we start, there should be a lower pressure. Really, the only pressure should be from the weight of the abdominal wall pushing down. And that, in most people, is probably around 6 to 9 millimeters of mercury. Again, if your patient's obese, it's going to be up there on the higher end. So if you see a single-digit initial insufflation pressure with your varus needle, you're pretty happy. You think you're probably in the right space. If you get an immediate number of like 15 or 17 or something like that, you think you're probably... Um, a bit too high, you're probably going to have to pull it out and check again. So again, a quick review of all the different 
aspects and techniques that we use to um, access the abdominal cavity safely. Let's do it this time in the midline at the umbilicus. We go through the skin. Then we come down here, we get one click at the linea alba. We get a second click through the peritoneum. And remember, we've been holding up on the umbilical stock this whole time, trying to pull the wall away from our intra-abdominal contents. We hear our two clicks. We wiggle our needle along the axis. We feel like the tip moves freely. Then we do our aspiration tests. We don't aspirate any blood or bile. We feel good about that. We inject some saline that flows freely. We feel good about that. We take the syringe off, watch the liquid fall down into the abdominal cavity. We feel good about that. And then finally, we hook ourselves up to our insufflation, look for our initial pressures. We see a single digit pressure, let's say six millimeters of mercury. And then we are pretty confident that we're in. And then we can start insufflating the abdomen, um, usually using high flow at that point. So let's say <coughs> that one of these steps goes wrong. How do we troubleshoot? So just some of the basics here. Um, let's say you're aspirating, you aspirate blood or bile. This is obviously very concerning. You think you've probably made some sort of either bowel injury or major vascular injury. The key there is that you do not want to remove your varus needle at that point. You just want to turn the stopcock and kind of lock it off and leave it in place. And you want to go somewhere else and get access there. And that will allow you to look back at the initial site and see what you've injured. Because you can imagine if you just pull this out, get in somewhere else, and you try to find the spot of that injury, it can be quite difficult. So if you get blood or bile, leave it, go somewhere else, and look back at the initial um, site of insertion. If, say, you are able to aspirate, but your injection or drop tests don't go too well, a lot of times you just have the tip buried in a little bit of momentum. You can kind of withdraw slightly, wiggle the tip around. A lot of times that momentum will fall off and then the, the drop will go down. If the drop doesn't go down, but you are still pretty certain you're in the right place, you can just hook it up to insufflation. Sometimes you then jiggle it a little bit as the insufflation starts, the momentum falls off um, and you start insufflating the abdomen as well. Um, and then finally, if you're getting bad pressures, specifically very high pressures, a lot of times you just pull it out and start again. All right, and again, so when it all goes well, it works great. We just put in our ports, we check the site of that initial varus needle, make sure there was no injury and go about our case. But if we get one of these very rare complications, and remember these are certainly much less than 1%, most of them less than even 0.1 or 0.2%, um, and many of them are really quite minor. And that's, again, why the varus needle is such an accepted technique. If you have an injury, for example, to a solid organ, liver, spleen, something like that, as long as you didn't insufflate a bunch of CO2 into the blood supply by doing that, which is pretty difficult to do, uh, there's almost nothing you have to do in that case. If you have a bowel injury, you want to find that injury and close it, usually just with a simple stitch or two. Again, it's a needle, so it should be a very small injury. And then the two very serious complications would be something like a major vascular injury to the aorta, IVC, iliac vein, or artery, etc. That would usually require conversion to an open surgery and emergent repair of that vascular structure, or an air embolism where you insufflate CO2 causing usually acute cardiac arrest. Um, this is, of course, the absolute worst complication. Um, you're doing CPR on the table. And the uh, kind of buzzwords that at least the board exams want you to know if you ever deal with an air embolism is that you want to put the patient in Trendelenburg and left lateral decubitus. And because I think remembering phrases like that in the heat of a very emergent moment is not a great idea, I always remember it as head down in Berg and then right side up. And that's how you're supposed to position this patient to have the air sit in the heart in such a way that it does not cause immediate arrest and gives you time to potentially aspirate it, do CPR, support with pressors, et cetera. So again, if you ever suspect an air embolism, which would be when you have sudden cardiac arrest um, or a very rapid decrease in end tidal CO2 while you're insufflating, you want to be thinking about putting the patient in head down in Berg or Trendelenburg position and left lateral decubitus with the right side up uh, while you provide uh, emergent supportive care. All right, so to review, remember that safe abdominal access is a critical step in MIS surgery. And if you're a beginning surgical trainee, this is a part of the case that you really should be paying close attention to. Um, the varus needle is a very popular technique to do its speed, its ease and safety. Um, and again, to use the needle, remember that We'll draw our stylized abdominal wall one more time. Remember that you take your needle, usually make an incision through the skin, come down, 
hit fascia, one click, hit fascia, two clicks, through peritoneum, three clicks. Um, once you're in there, you can wiggle around the axis, see if it feels like it's in the right place. Do your aspiration and then injection and drop test. Then hook yourself up to insufflation and check that initial pressure, looking for usually a single digit pressure somewhere around six to nine millimeters of mercury. Then you can go ahead and insufflate. And once you place your pour either through that same tract or somewhere else, just be sure to look at roughly the spot where you entered, make sure you didn't cause any sort of injury. All right, so that's it. These videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use to diagnose or treat any diseases. This is not clinical advice, and we will see you next time.